Good tidings and salutations, all you beautiful individuals. Welcome to another FPL League Online here. And Mark here with you to break down a little semi final showdown. These were cinematic pieces of art, these teaser videos mashing up the little Parisian art and sculpting alongside the head of these rivalries talking directly to each other. And I'm convinced that now filming these teaser videos when you're opposite T1 makes your mental even more fragile because you have to go through the history and listen to them trash talk. And I felt it on the Gen G side of the rift in this series. And you can't avoid it because they're nope. playing it right before you get on stage, all these things. You're getting that extra dosage of it right before you hit Summoner's Rift of the extra T1 propaganda going through the history and recounting all the amazing stories and legends of old and new. Here we are with T1 crushing their domestic demon in Gen G on the world semifinal stage, setting us up for an unbelievable finals between T1 and BLG. And, you know, I mentioned Genji have owned T1 for two years domestically in the LCK and in interviews afterwards, by the way, huge shout out, both Canyon and Lehens doing the interview circuit after what I'm sure is a heartbreaking loss. But Canyon saying even that barren sneak that they are late to that is absolutely the turning point in that first game. He talks about for the rest of the series, Genji were playing a little impatient because of they felt like they had that game one maybe in the bag until that moment and played impatient after that. Even though they had a dominant game two, you could feel little micro mistakes that we haven't seen Genji make all year. And I want to go to the point talking about Canyon and Lahens talking to the media after the performance like this, because I think, again, so easy from the sidelines to brush it off, to go, yeah, well, of course, you still got to be responsible and talk and, and answer all these questions type of things. But even in a little, you know, side note type of thing, playing some stupid video games this weekend, playing, uh, you know, the baseball MLB, the show, I got to the major leagues. We lost the game. I'm pissed. It sucks. They make you do an interview after it type of thing. And I'm just sitting there going through it and I'm going, man, all those times, all those League of Legends ones, where would they rather be anywhere but yeah. doing that type of interview? So got to give them the shout outs to that. And as you, as you said, getting little bits of nuggets, a little bit of information from that interview and talking about their mental state was so fragile at that point that just that T1 Baron take, that steal, that classic T1 20 to 25 minutes, let's get on Baron type of situation. And unlike the FlyQuest series, the Ziggs bombs come in and it's not enough damage. There isn't any way to stall out anymore. T1 get the Baron, they get the fight afterwards. And from there, as Canyon said, it was all shattered from that point onwards, basically having that shot go across in that first game after all the pregame intros, everything else like that. But you're looking at T1 like an unkillable beast. Yeah, and listen, in that game four, when they get so far behind, credit where credit's due, they get this ace, and all of a sudden, it feels like you're probably going to game five. They catch out Faker in the iconic, like, poetry ruler spot where he was at 2017, but T1's able to turn around at 4v5, pays flashes the wrong way on the Ash in that final team fight. I know the Skarner ults have been a plague to AD carries around uh, the globe trying to uh, flash away out of those. But T1 turns his 4v5 around. And one of the big stories of this series is absolutely the reason these interviews were so tough for Lahens is because he was absolutely gapped. One of his worst series probably on the year for Genji and Kyria was absolutely styled on the Renata and then the Pike in game four. And this was an interesting one heading into it because Lehens and Kyria have had some history, have had some back and forth in their career of where they've gone. And they've basically traded a lot of success, right? You know, all the way throughout this one, Kyria, his success with T1 is well documented. But of course, Lehens joining in on this Gen G roster and how it took a little bit of time to see the bot lane perform to the level that we expected and wanted it to for this top tier team didn't give us that level of performance on the day in this series. I think he was a little bit out of sorts, out of communication, out of out of the loop and synergy with the rest of his teammates, with some of these engages, some of these chances, some of the opportunities that he gave up onto the side of T1. And 
the other glaring thing after the series, I think, is you, and this can go back to the FlyQuest series, but you see a Nidalee Tristana mid come in during an elimination game in the semifinals, and that screams to me, that's not a crazy pocket pick out of Canyon. That's not the pick to fall back to Anchovy. That seems like Gen.G never had a full grasp of what was best in this meta. Yeah, there's two ways to take it, and sometimes it depends on, on the result and how things play out and what you see. And again, when you get those type of situations to go, yes, fall back on old reliable, fall on what you know and trust and you like and these type of situations, there's a difference in doing that as a power move and difference of doing that as there's nothing else. We got anything else to figure out here? No, nobody, nobody. All right, let's roll with, with the Nidalee type of situation. Let's roll with the Tristana in the mid lane that smolder is out of there which that's a topic that needs to be talked about t1 pick and ban identification was spot on once again when we talk about them having success the world championship is a big place where it starts not only negating what gen g want to get their players their hands on and what they want to use but also securing it for t1 setting up these compositions all the way through t1 was able to do that massively throughout this uh, entire series and, you know, in multiple roles, right? It wasn't just, you know, Kyria popping off on stuff. Faker continues to die by this Lich Bane Ari, even though nobody else is building it. And even though he gets caught out, you know, he still had a very solid performance on that. The Akali was obviously a highlight. And 4.9 million peak viewership, the most ever for a non-finals and top five in the history of the game. Uh, obviously, you knew T1 Genji was going to pull some serious numbers. And even though, you know, with two of the games kind of being one-sided stomps, game four was absolutely the best of this series and uh, maybe didn't deliver to the insanity that we were expecting, but just the pure storylines heading into the semifinals were just absolute chef's kiss. Oh, so, so juicy. You loved all of them, all that you got to see. Of course, one of the big ones that you can talk about through this one is that moment. Faker gets caught out on the Ari, and it's the other four members of T1 that rally together that bail him out through their performance in the team fight. So many times we talk about, there goes Faker, there goes T1, right? That was not the story in this game for the rest of his teammates had his back. And I think it brings up this conversation, right? We have so many times, and again, on the other side, Chovy. We always talk about who is the next faker, who's going to dethrone him. Got to give credit to Cajal for this uh, little conversation, this little nugget of thought. What if we're not looking in the right spot? What if we're looking at all these other teams? We're looking at Chovy. We're looking at Knight. All these type of things. What if the next fakers are already on T1 right beside him? In Zeus, Owner, Guma, Kyria. They've all got three World Finals appearances on their resume. Not a lot of guys that you're going to be able to find like that. Only guys pretty much alongside Faker for these type of runs. These are the ones that you have to look at, and they've already carved out their careers like this. You get their owner in there. He's got a semifinals and then three finals in a row for T1. Pretty incredible stuff. Yeah, obviously, they've now made three straight world finals two different times as an organization. But this one is even crazier because it is the same five. When, he, when Faker and the boys were going 2015 to 2017, they were changing top jungle pretty much every year at the very least heading into that. So the fact that these five have stuck together for so long and had such unbelievable success. Now, I mean, the other four have an opportunity to have more world titles than LCK titles. Well, that's that's wild. I think that that's a possibility. <laughs> the way things have played out for T1, of course, it understands and that plays into Gen G's emergence as that top threat domestically and how they have pushed T1. But there still seems to be that lacking difference, that lacking edge between Gen G domestically and Gen G internationally compared to T1 and the level up and the beast that they become once you start entering these type of events. BLG domestically and BLG internationally, same result when they're matching up against Wei Bo Gaming. And listen, make no mistake, this was 3-0, but the first two games, the final team fight, if it goes the other way, Weibo's winning. It came down to that very last battle on the Rift. It's one of those ones where it plays out, and obviously by just looking at the stats and the scoreline, you might say, okay, this is certainly an improvement, a more dominant showing from BLG compared to the last time they played around. This is a level up, all these sorts of things. It's in the finer details that you see that this is pretty much more or less exactly how the other series played out. It's just that you're flip-flopping one of these wins, one of these you know, uh, team fight wins at the end of it. 
And that's what leads BLG to have that advantage as they go into the obviously the deciding and decisive third game where they find the thing. This is a BLG team that could not be stopped, could not be denied. They have been tested and, and run through the full run of this world championship. And here they are standing on the other side of T1 of the world finals. The Lahens Kyria gap was the biggest glaring mark in that T1 Gen G series. The Knight Zhaohu matchup was the biggest glaring mismatch in this one. Even with a couple of Yone games out of Zhaohu, it was Knight going 15 0 and 15 on the Syndra and Akali to close this one out in, you know, what was one of the best series internationally we've seen from Knight maybe ever really important because i think a lot of people again a lot of stock is very low on chovy chovy and knight are the two premier mid laners that we talk about behind somewhat as established excuse me as faker you look at how he was able to play in this series and how it sets himself up excuse me for that finals against faker that head-to-head -head matchup syndra being that pick for him of course we know well documented of course faker's history with syndra we've got a world championship skin for him on the champion, but now the Akali, that's the one I want to identify in on because I think that the way that it was utilized, the priority, the, the threat that she was able to represent for Faker and T1 in this series, that's definitely a change because we've seen him try to roll Akali throughout this year at various points and not have that type of effect whatsoever. So to see that in this series, to see Knight have that type of effect on the Akali, that's one of the champions that I'm going to be looking at, you know, one that will escape the pick and ban type of situation and be an available option. That's what I'm looking at for both these mid laners. Knight, by the way, most champions, unique champions played at this event. 12 different ones in 15 games. Uh, so, yeah, we know he's got quite a champion ocean. And, again, similarities with him and Kyria in this series is... They were laughing. They were having fun. Kyria was definitely sweating in that game for the final fight, screaming what to do and was the most excited. But they're having fun when they're both playing at such a high level. It's obviously easier to have fun. But definitely the lifeblood of these two squads are those two players. And obviously the other big thing to look at for Weibo in this series is three straight games, Jax Skarner for BLG getting through. And surprisingly... Breathe holds his own against Ben Jackson pretty much all three of these games. It was the Skarner that was the bigger issue for Weibo. I've hated it. I've hated it all since we've had him. You know, he came back in and there's maybe a little bit of excitement because, oh, he's back in, you know, in meta type of appearance. And, oh, here's a little bit of a rework, blah, blah, blah. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. I don't want to see it. No more. No more of this, you know, guy going through walls, barreling in, saying, here's where I'm driving. Boom. And he gets, you know, two, three of your carries. And then that's the team fight type of situation. People I don't still see don't it. know the hitbox of his ulti. That's why we're getting all these bad flashes. Hell, man, I don't even know the hitbox of this thing still. And I'm watching it hit all these champions and everything else throughout these games. I don't want to see that Skarner in these finals on either side. I want to see that one taken away. Jax, that is the big one. That's going to be the interesting one. I think, obviously, of course, Zeus more than proficient enough on that champion, but certainly doesn't gravitate towards it the way that some of these top laners do like bin and the way that he is able to make that a priority champion for himself i think that the, the you know you're going to be looking at how breathe was able to stay in lane stay in that territory to be a factor of course skarner excluded in a lot of these situations and listen zeus i think multiple picks out of bin you can talk renekton you can talk Jax. he's got this gragas pocket pick to fall back on to counter some of these this Gragas pocket pick has been phenomenal right now in a way that a lot of teams, I don't, I can't believe they haven't prioritized onto what Gragas is able to bring to these team fights because so much of these, you know, Yone's, the Smolder situation, heck, Ziggs, throw it back in there. They want to have these perfectly manufactured team fights where they are in the right spot, throwing it in, they're safe, everything's all good, you're a gonzo type of situation. Gragas ulti comes in, boom. I don't care how this team fight was set up. Wherever that Gragas ulti lands, it gets them. It's making it a heck of a chaotic fight. And once that chaos is introduced, T1's all over it. They know exactly how to pounce on these type of situations. I am surprised that other teams haven't gone to this Gragas option. And obviously, Zeus is a mastermind in finding these angles, whether it's a re-engage or disengage on the Gragas to pick off key targets. Uh, he's played it absolutely beautifully throughout you, this you want You want a champion that is proficient at handling these lane swaps as well? Dragon.
right there. He has been phenomenal in how he's been able to even make those big feet dance dippity move down underneath the turret and slide around, belly bump you and all to make sure that he is staying safe in that lane swap, no matter how many people you're bringing down into that side. Uh, that plus the emergence in both of these series of some Maokai top action to survive some of these dives and there's going to be some weird picks coming through uh, in finals on that top side for sure. But I think T1 BLG as the matchup, when you saw the quarterfinal draw, you were probably saying that's probably the most hype possibility. You were you were sweating it in the Swiss stage because you thought this might not be a possibility later in the event. But this is about as hyped up as we can be, as marquee as a lineup as you can get heading into this world finals. BLG T1 uh, you know, Knight and Faker in the mid lane. Of course, you've got Jax. Not Jax. Yeah, he might as well be Jax. Uh, Bin up in the top side against Zeus. And then, heck, go down to the bottom lane. How about Elk versus Guma? That's going to be a matchup that I think a lot of people are sleeping on. But one of the most high profile ones we can have when you're looking at this finals appearance. And, you know, I think the pike out of curia is now something that will be fully on the blg radar it's not going to be a surprise pick coming in uh throughout this series and i mean across the board these are insane matchups and two guys like head to head in each role you can highlight them being near the best uh, of this tournament even though blg had that slow start since they've been one and two they've looked equally as terrifying throughout yeah one and one and two basically it's one of these ones where you can't dismiss the way that they got to one and two in these type of situations and to realize that that is still part of the identity of this team that is the one that is in the world finals but that also comes with uh, accepting and acknowledging that the run that they have been on since that point is also a blg and that's the type of thing that you got to contend with at the finals and how about g2 sitting at home going well, we played the two teams that went to finals man come on uh Heck, you throw in a little bit of, you know, maybe maybe it's not, maybe it is. I'm, I'm willing to give them the credit. Maybe T1's uh, willingness to go through the pike and, and use it in these type of ways is a little bit of that old stinging memory of the pike from G2 that was such a problem for them to deal with. Different place, I understand. But yes, love to see this one. And yeah, for G2, it doesn't help any little bit because I think at this point you didn't need to see this type of validation to understand just how difficult the run and the, and how unlucky the the ones that you did draw for the event were. We'll obviously do a full breakdown, full preview of that T1 BLG Grand Finals, but we do have a little bit of off-season drama. We thought maybe Ruler would be sitting pretty on JDG, even though they miss Worlds, he's on contract through 2025, but they have amicably split up according to JDG, which then everyone gets to work. Okay, where's Ruler heading? Is he staying in the LPL? Well, the top four teams have pretty solid AD carries when you're talking Gala. Light had a great performance. Elk, okay, he's not going on JDG, so maybe he's going back to the LCK. Obviously, he has said... He's only going to go back to the LCK if he's playing for Gen G. And before Worlds, he would have said no chance. But now you might be thinking after this exit for Gen G, you know this star studded roster is going to be blown up to some degree. Pays might want to get a big payday. Maybe Gen G wants to shell out to bring Ruler back. Well, that's going to be the thing is, is what the expense is going to be in that type of situation. When we're talking about a Gen G landing spot for Ruler, I think the important thing to note is we expected him to not only stay with JDG because of the contract term, but also understanding JDG's got them big bucks. They're willing. They could spend. They could facilitate a roster to his type of level one with uh, LPL title, world's aspirations type of thing. Amicably, amicably splitting part, parting ways that's got to tell me that they are not going to be looking for that type of angle so we can kind of early maybe cross off jdg from that ultra top tier of the lpl type of situation and then when it gets to ruler going to gen g it's one of these ones where my eye is on well if you're replacing pays you're probably going to have to come in on a budget compared to pays which is not exactly where someone like ruler lines up in as far as where his value is and all these other type of things. So I don't know if that's going to be necessarily the one. Well, then the question goes, well, then where? Because if it's not Gen G, which he has said it is going to be, if he goes back on that, where in the LCK, well, 
Hanwha Life has got Viper, and I'm pretty sure they're probably pretty happy and stable with him in that option. Again, KT Rolster has been one of these ones that we've talked about that will have that opening and could be a team that wants to push up to it, but there has been zero indication whether they're willing to spend to that type of level. And they have a challenger duo bot lane that has been smurfing in challengers that they've been alluding to promoting for a few splits now. Yes, and they have also, though, uh, at least kind of the one little thing that goes into that still unsure about it type of situation is BDD is confirmed to be returning yep. for KT Rolster, so that's something to keep track of. Him and Ruler have played together before? I think we can easily maybe squash the Shopify Rebellion Ruler ones out there for you. Absolutely. That's their entire over. budget for the year to run the entire organization. To <laughs> it, that's not the Korean ADC you're getting. You're getting B-Boy. He's coming back. And you know what? Uh, there was a lot of uh, stuff about that last year, but we can leave it on. You should be pretty happy about that one, all things considered. If you're Shopify Rebellion at this point, back to Ruler. It is this open-ended question. Where will he land? Will, where, will, where will he end up? Because this is a type of player that plays at his very best. He can change the fortunes for an organization. No question. And and I've seen a lot of Western hopium, right? You're saying G2 goes, oh, ruler's open. Sorry, Hansama. Uh, you don't speak English, ruler? That's okay. You just play AD carry and we'll be fine. Or maybe Team Liquid blows their end entire budget to get ruler back with his buddy core jj would be extremely exciting would also be very bad to see team liquid make that type of move to, to abandon yawn type of situation yes. would be very against what we have been building up and been happy to see from a directive point from team liquid and you know goes against spawn and everything else which i don't see that happening even with the korean connections that team liquid has got. I think a lot of the connection to G2 could be a possibility. I think that's one that there has been conversations with G2 before where they've talked about, you know, why they don't import players in this type of situation like that. And one of the answers they gave is it has to be someone that is this type of difference maker, someone that is an absolutely unquestioned mega superstar. Ruler is kind of the only name that fits that type of billing, that type of categories, and that type of thing. Ruler definitely a grenade into what other teams are going to be doing <laughs> and thinking about, especially with teams like Gen G probably blowing up stuff as well. It's going to be absolute madness when the offseason's in full swing. But that is it today for League Unlock. Eric and Mark here with you, beauties. Thanks so much for hanging out, and we will catch you on that flippity flip.